This is the Luis Palau Legacy Library. May this timeless message bless you today. And remember, a life on fire is a life well spent. We're praying that when we go home on Saturday, that we will go home recommitted, reconnected with God, that we'll go home feeling purified of anything that needs to be purified in our hearts, that you'll go home and become very fruitful in your life so that you can look back on July 17 here and say, man, my life really took a big turn for the good that we did over there. So that's another one. And then we want you to go joyful and filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't know if you saw a rock somewhere. Well, there's rocks all over, but one of them has some writing on it. And it says that they had a prayer meeting. Did you see it? Henrietta Mears led it. And fellows like Bill Bright, who founded Campus Crusade, let's see, the fellow Halverson, Rich Halverson, who was Senate uh, chaplain in the USA, a great Presbyterian pastor who was superb, and many other people were revived at that prayer meeting on the grounds here. And they left this place. And even Billy Graham had a good experience over here. And they revolutionized their generation. We need it again. In those days when that happened, Bill Bright wasn't a well-known person. He didn't have an organization, but he came out of here so fired up, so filled with joy, so filled with the Holy Spirit and faith that they evangelized millions upon millions and millions of people, a tremendous legacy. So let's pray that when we leave Saturday, every man here today, every woman, that will go home so fired up that your local church will say, what in the world happened to you, you know? And say, where is that? In California, among some rocks. Let's go next summer, you know, and, uh, and see if it doesn't happen in the church. Because in the end, everything good belongs in the local church. And so let's do that. Now, what I decided to pray through about is to talk about what the theologians call the upper room discourse. You remember on the last night when Jesus Christ was going to be crucified, Judas Iscariot treacherously sold him for 30 miserable pieces of silver. It had only been gold, but silver, how cheap can you get, you know? But he sold the Lord. The Lord knew he was going to be crucified the next day. And he meets with the 12 apostles. He started the Lord's Supper. It hadn't been held until then. And then he began to talk to them. And so we're going to read, five, not tonight, but every night, one chapter, five chapters. The second night, we'll have to read two. I recommend that you read it for yourself if you have time. And notice this, I'll tell you what. In the chapter today is going to be chapter 13 of John. And you'll notice that as soon as we read it, I think, that the subject is purity, purity. How God delivers purity and also expects purity if we're going to be close to the Lord in his presence. Tomorrow, uh, chapter 14 establishes a very fundamental thing. Heaven is the place we're going to when he comes back or when we die. And knowing that gives you solidity to launch out to bless the rest of the world. So purity, uh, heaven. Thirdly, chapter 15 is fruitfulness. You remember the vine and the branches. How can a man or a woman be fruitful for God all their life and have results and blessing and bless other people? And that brings tremendous joy. Number four is uh, the Holy Spirit. And tonight we've been meditating just a bit in the worship about the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit makes us want to be pure, gives us the assurance of heaven, and makes us fruitful. And how a man or a woman, not a clergy person, but just a regular Christian, can be so filled with the Holy Spirit that you have his counsel, his guidance, his teaching, his comfort. I mean, the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And then chapter 17, we won't have time to deal with it except in one moment at the end of Thursday night. It's uh, the fire of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, the next day he's going to be crucified. He knows Judas has got a plan in place. And as we read, you're going to notice it. He knows that Peter's going to deny him. He knows that all of them were going to flee and leave him alone. Even though they loved him, they became chicken and they ran off. And the Lord knows all this. And yet he gives these five chapters. And you know, I've been studying it quite a bit lately. I've read it through the years. But lately, what I noticed is it covers almost every imaginable doctrine that you can imagine. I made a little list just before we read chapter 15. It, it all talks about joy, 
happiness, rejoicing. He's going to be crucified the next day. And yet he says, you can have the full measure of my joy. I tell you these things so you'll be happy. I mean, the Lord is thinking of us. Victory, partakers of the divine nature. Talk about the Holy Trinity, about heaven, about being temples of the Holy Spirit, about being adopted into the family of God, that he sanctifies us with the fire of God, that we are one with him and one with each other in love, that Christ lives in us. We can know God personally. We can be hated by the world. That's the only negative thing I could think of in all these chapters, that we are clean already, that he restores those who stumble, that there's spiritual warfare, and it goes on and on and on. So it's five amazing chapters. Tonight, we'll just read chapter 13 of John, and then we'll only meditate on a little portion of it, the one about the washing of the disciples' feet. So let's read the Holy Word of God, John chapter 13, and then we'll t read one in First John chapter 1. Okay, here we go. It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So what does he do to show the full extent of his love? The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around them. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon replied, not just my feet, my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who's had a bath, needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, not every one of you is clean. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and asked them, do you not understand what I've done for you? Now you call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, this is the passage we're going to study for a few minutes, but I think we should read the rest of the chapter because it sets a context and makes you think the thoughts of Jesus. What must the mind of Jesus that night when he's about to go to the cross in a few hours? I'm not referring to all of you. I know those that I've chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone that I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. And after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit, and he testified, I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. The disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple Jesus loved, was reclining next to Jesus. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and said, ask him, ask him what he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread after I have dipped it in the dish. 
And then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus said to him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought that he was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give some to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Let's stop right there. And let's go, if you don't mind, to 1 John chapter 1. In chapter 1 of 1 John, verse 3, listen to this explanation that matches John 13 and the washing of feet. Verse 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make your joy complete. This is the message that we had heard from Him and declared to you. God is light. In Him, there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and the truth is not in our, in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you do not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's the word of the Lord, and it's wonderful to be able to read it. Now, in this chapter, as we read it, you may have noticed perhaps three things about the Apostle Peter, who is the focus of attention at this point. First of all, a man with defiled feet. Here they are having a dinner in the old-fashioned way that they did in Israel in those days. They all come, they sit around on the floor, they weren't tables. They might be lifted up uh, maybe half a foot off the ground, but everybody just sat around, took their sandals off when they came in the door, and uh, their feet would be dirty, even though they all would have taken a bath, as Jesus said. But their feet would be dirty from the dust of Jerusalem, which is sort of the dust up here next August coming up. It's going to be very dusty. It would be the same if you didn't wash your feet almost, sitting around that dish and uh, sitting on the ground, as if somebody came to dinner tonight without their sandals, and they've been walking on the street, and they put their feet on top of the table. You know, it'd be pretty disgusting, and somebody would punch them down. Uh, you know, that's what happened when they showed up. But Peter had defiled feet. The second thing you notice is a man with a defiant heart. And the, the lesson was coming out on the washing of the feet. And when Jesus took on the, the form of a slave, which is what slaves used to do, but they didn't do it that night. Nobody did, thought about washing each other's feet. Jesus is doing it. He comes to Peter. That's why we love Peter, you know. He was an uh, aggressive Californian. And, uh, you know, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? No way. And the Lord says, okay, I won't wash your feet, but if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And suddenly Peter is, What? No part with the, then Lord, take the whole dish, pour it on my head, pour it on my arms. Suddenly he, he goes crazy. Just pour the whole basin on me. The idea of not having anything to do with Jesus was unacceptable to Peter. And then finally, you see in Peter, in this situation, a man with a desperate cry. Lord, lay it on me. I want to have a part with you. Now, you know, uh, there's a lawyer here, at least one, and he's a Christian which is always a surprise. And uh, a lawyer friend of mine who really is a Bible student in Orange County, he said, Luis, I sometimes preach about the blessings that God gives when you open your heart to Christ. And I have about 25. And he said, there's 52 if you really study carefully. So I believe him. He's a lawyer and I don't want him to sue me. So uh, I like said 52, but I want to pick three big ones tonight. 
about the Christian life and mention it to you. Uh, you know, the first thing that I want to mention tonight, the Christian life is supposed to be and can be a triumphant life. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. And then in Romans 8, I think it is at the end, it says, we are more, more than victorious through Him who loved us. We are more than triumphant through Him who loved us. The Christian life was meant to be a victorious life. Now, that implies warfare. Victory means you're confronting somebody. In sports, that's another deal. But when we're talking here, it's war. There's spiritual war. And you and I experience it. And it isn't just when you're a kid. You get to be my age, and the war is still on. It's spiritual warfare. And there's one enemy, and he uses two medium to attack us. Sometimes we say there are three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, Ray Steadman, an old pastor from Palo Alto, used to say, there's one enemy, and he uses two avenues to get at us. Satan, uh, you remember the verse in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it in abundance. And you know, this warfare thing is real. We were listening to the um, uh, teaching this morning about families and couples. Why can't a man and a woman get along? You know, we love each other supposedly when we meet and gush all over and all this stuff. And then about three years later, we're at it again. And, you know, oh, you don't do this. You, all the stuff that they, they're going to teach us about. But, but why is it that we can't be victorious? The second thing about the Christian life that I wanted to mention is that we read it in 1 John chapter 1. The Christian life can be not only a triumphant life, but a transparent life. If we are going to be near to God, there has to be a way that we walk in the light with God, where we don't hide stuff, we don't cover up stuff, we, don't, we walk in the light. And this brings freedom, and it brings happiness, and it brings joy to the Christian life. And then the third one I want to mention, I call it a total lifestyle. And I get that from Ephesians 3.19. It says, Paul says, I pray, it's a long little prayer, but it ends up with this, that you may be filled with God himself that you may be filled with God himself. And, you know, think of those three things. And we know it's in the Word of God. We know it's what we expected when we were converted, at least those who were converted later in life, that it would be a triumphant life, overcoming sin, overcoming temptation, not perfect, but victorious, overcoming the enemy, Satan and the flesh and the world with its temptations, that it would be a transparent life, Pure, purified by the blood of Christ, that we walk in the light with God, and then a total lifestyle, which is saturated by God himself. Now, it's a glorious thing. And all of us, if we had a chance, we say, hey, man, man, that's what I really want. But why is it, if it's possible? You know, when you talk about a triumphant life or a God-centered life, I often think of uh, the other verse beside John 10.10. 10. I wrote it down, Psalm 23.5. You anoint my head with oil, my cup, King James Version, runneth over. A life that runs over with the oil of the Holy Spirit, with the joy of the Lord. We know that's what the Lord offers. But why is it that so many don't enjoy it then? What is it that takes away? Why are so many in our circles not living a joyful life? Why are there so many defeats? And, and of course, the whole subject that today was brought up about the percentage of divorce is astonishing, and uh, people who stumble in their moral life and their business life and their personal life. Why? Why can't we live a free life of triumph, of transparency, and filled with the Holy Spirit? You remember Jesus said in John seven thirty seven, he said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And this he said about the Holy Spirit that those who believed in him were going to receive. So that's what the Lord would like us to live, a life of victory over the enemy, over temptation. Yes, not to perfection until we see him, but yes, a life of victory. And then a life that's transparent and a total lifestyle where God is at the center of our lives. Now, why is it that many of us are not enjoying that kind of a life? And all of us in some periods in our life 
have foolishly allowed ourselves into that. And you know, as you study the scripture, you find that this is the situation. Nobody can take away your joy. No one can take away your love. No one can take away your peace. No one can take away your gentleness. The only thing that can steal all this from you is unconfessed, unresolved sin. Your mother-in-law cannot take away the joy if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Your son-in-law cannot take it away from you either if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The only thing that can take away the joy, the victory, the transparency, the cup overflowing, a God-filled life is undealt with sin. And until we deal with sin, we can't enjoy the presence of God. The fellows leading us in worship used the phrase a few minutes ago, in the presence of the Lord. The Lord has the disciples in his presence. And all of them are good guys, except Judas who was going to betray him, Peter who was going to deny him. They were all going to run away, but the Lord loved them. And he showed the full extent of his love. First, and that's all we're going to look at tonight, by washing their feet. In other words, brothers and sisters, in the world, as we get along, we pick up dirt and dust every single day. Even if you get up in the morning and you sing, and you maybe meditate on one verse or a whole passage, and you leave for work or school or whatever with a full determination, I want to live a joyful life today. I'm going to be triumphant. I want to be transparent. I want to be God-filled today. But the day goes on, and you listen to the news, and some bad news, or you're at work, and somebody double-crosses you, or something goes wrong, in the, or you see somebody, and you're tempted, or you listen to a dirty joke, and it fills your mind with stuff you shouldn't have thought of. You come home, you still love the Lord, but before you go to sleep at night, the Lord is saying, here, look, I am here to purify your feet, to clean you so that you can be full of love again, full of joy again, victorious again. And you know, every day, every one of us has to spend time washing our feet in the presence of the Lord. One Bible commentator would say, you know, when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, where he makes intercession for us. In other words, the Lord is dedicated for you and for me and all the millions who love him. How he does it is his business. He is God. He knows how to do it. But then he's looking at me, and he's looking at you, and he says, I want you to walk in the light. I want you to enjoy transparency in your life. I want you to be filled with joy. I am here to wash your feet. And you know, when the Lord talks about washing, it really is what do we do with sin? Some time ago, I was in a conference in Florida. No, it was in South Carolina. And uh, this young guy, a very successful guy from the East Coast, said, I need to have dinner with you tonight. So he said, great. One of my sons says, he wants to talk to you about the whole subject of sin in the Christian's life. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. Should have sent by Weiss, not me. But anyway, so we sat down and he said, I said to him, my son says, you want to talk to me? And he said, yeah. He said, I'm a Christian and he's a very successful business guy. And uh, he said, why in Christian circles do we make such a big deal about sin? After all, we know we're all sinners. So some do this sin and some do that sin, but why do we harp on it? Why do we have to talk about it? Why is it such a big deal? That's a phrase that got my attention. It's the kind of phrases I like to use. Why is it such a big deal? And you know, I began to think about it and I made a list to myself why it actually is a big deal and what is the remedy for sin. And let me read to you a little list why sin is such a big deal that the Lord the first thing he does that night, they're having the meal. He's instituted Holy Communion. He's going to be crucified within hours. And he suddenly talks about cleansing their feet, cleansing their sin. First, sin offends our Creator. It's like spitting in his face. Sin is like saying, God, I know what you think. I know what you said, but I don't give a rip. And you spit in his face. You offend God. You, you grieve the Holy Spirit. That's why sin is a big deal. Number two, and I have 17, not from the lawyer. I picked this one. And uh, sin is a big deal because it demeans your self-respect. 
your own dignity. We are created in the image and likeness of God. God is holy. And when we willingly, carelessly, sloppily, and almost approvingly sin, we're really demeaning ourselves because we were created to be like Him. We were created in the image and likeness of God. Number three, sin hurts other people. Almost every sin we commit, even if it isn't directly against a person, has an indirect impact on people around us. It demeans others and their dignity also. Number four, we reap a steep price with unexplained troubles that come upon you when you have unresolved sin, undealt with sin. Number five, there seems to be a restlessness that comes. I've experienced it, and I presume you have too. When we don't take care and settle the problem of sin in our life, I don't mean one of the biggies. It could be one of the big ones, but it could be whatever sin. There's a never-ending restlessness, a sense of, you know, things aren't what they're supposed to be. What's the problem with me? Number six, a sense of unexplainable sadness comes in. When there's unresolved sin, there's a sadness that clouds our spiritual life, and we can't explain it, and we can't seem to get rid of it. And then number seven, there's also what I call a lifelessness, a certain dull passivity, a lack of fire for the things of God, a, a sort of a sitting down in church and listening to the worship and maybe doing communion, but there's a lack of enthusiasm, a lack of vigor, a lack of thrill in the Christian life. Number eight, sin matters because if we don't deal with it properly, it'll send us to hell. So that's pretty important, I thought. I, that got me when I was a kid. Then number nine, I've been meditating on times when I have unresolved things, and I've had them through the years. There comes a confusing double-mindedness. You know, it says in James 1, a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. And I'm sure you've gone through it, and maybe some of you are going through it right now. A sense of, there, yes, but no, and maybe this, but maybe that. And I thought this would happen, but that isn't happening. And it says, a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. Number 10, I think, is, yeah, it creates a parenthesis in our spiritual growth in our relationship with the Lord. Because when we grieve the Holy Spirit, there's a blockage between us and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And even though He indwells us, and He lives within us, and we are His children, but it creates a stop, a gap. And you know, you may never recuperate that gap if it goes on long enough. So the sooner we settle it, the sooner we sit down and have our feet washed and we confess our sin and we get rid of it and start walking with God on the spot, then we can begin to continue to grow spiritually. But if we don't deal with it, it creates a spiritual gap that could last for years. Also, there comes a sense of foreboding where there's unresolved sin, a sense of, for no apparent reason, a sense of things are not going well, things are not right. God is an, that's another one. But it seems like God doesn't answer our prayers. And many times we say, well, the Lord doesn't answer my prayers. And another thing that sin does, that makes you rail against God. And sometimes you find people who are believers, and then they start saying the most astonishing things about how could God allow this? And you say, yeah, who God? You say, where did this come from? This guy's a Christian, and he sort of blames God for this or that. It also, as I said earlier, but I want to make a point of it, it grieves the Holy Spirit. You know, as a child of God, you are the temple of God. We'll see that on uh, Thursday. Christ lives in us. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. The blessed Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. And when we have unresolved guilt on our mind and in our life, we grieve Him. The joy of the Lord can't fill you when the Holy Spirit is grieved within you. The love of the Lord can't flow when the Holy Spirit is grieved because we've cornered Him and refused to clear the decks and take care of the thing. So when the Lord sat with the disciples and began to cleanse their feet, this is what He had in mind. And then I'll mention two or three more. It defaces the image of God in us. You know, we are created in the image of God. When Christ comes in, He begins to rework us and wants to make us, Romans 8, creates us into the image of His Son. Well, when we have unresolved things in our life, undealt with, then that stops. And so we don't grow into the image of Christ. We just plain don't grow anymore. Also, I, this one has got me since I was a kid. You know, it says in the Beatitudes, 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That not only has to do with when you die, you go to see God because your, pure, your heart is pure by the blood of Christ. It has to do with our vision of God, even as we walk here on earth, that we can enjoy the presence of God, that we can enjoy worship, that we can enjoy listening to the Word of God. Another thing that sin does also, it makes you cynical about being counseled. When somebody gives you advice, there's a tendency to say, oh yeah, thanks a lot. You know, I remember there was a fellow I knew, my wife and I, he was well known, he's been dead for quite a while. And he was a, a good guy. I mean, a handsome guy, good looking and everything. But he was drifting spiritually, and we noticed he was, he and his wife were not getting along too well. And, and uh, one day I called him in, I said, it's good to have fun, you're handsome, suntan, muscly, you know, you got it all. But be careful, you know, with the younger girls playing volleyball, your wife is, never seems to be there. And, and he said, okay, thanks, thanks. Then I knew I got to deal with this guy. Well, he finally left his wife with a younger gal from Minneapolis. Not that it matters, but it was Minneapolis. And, uh, uh, yeah, beside he had three others, one in Portland, one here. And, uh, anyway, he's a hot number. But uh, you despise counseling because it gets you. It gets to you. When you're walking in the light and somebody exhorts you, you may not like it, and they may not be the most pleasant people, but you say, the Lord is speaking to me. I'm going to listen. So the last thing I'll mention is this. Sin matters because it was sin that sent our Savior to the cross of Calvary. So sin is very important. We can't just dismiss it and say, oh, just get over it. Or like my buddy from the East Coast said, basically, what he was saying was, he said, we're all sinners, so let's stop talking about it and get it over with. Well, you don't get it over with that way. So what are we supposed to do with sin when we feel that we need to clear our day? Proverbs 28, 13 puts it so well, I'm going to quote it. It goes like this. Whoever covers up his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses it and renounces it will find mercy. Whoever covers up his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces it will find mercy. So the first step is first to admit and say, I'm a believer, but there are things in my life that need to be cleared up. And you know, the good thing is this, God doesn't play games with us. The Holy Spirit, it says in the John, we'll read it later, or if you've read it, I'm sure. It says, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit doesn't play games with us. He doesn't say, ah, I'm going to let you sweat and find out for yourself why you're not walking in victory or in, vi or in transparency or you're not walking in a, in a fruitful, victorious life. The Holy Spirit immediately points the... Clearly, He convicts you of what needs to be dealt with. I used to say in the old days, and I'm going to say it today, the devil accuses, the Holy Spirit convicts. When you feel a sense of guilt, but you can't pinpoint it, it's probably not of God. It's probably the devil trying to keep you entertained, feeling guilty for nothing specific. When the Holy Spirit wants you to clear up something, he will remind you, especially when you get on your knees and you pray, before you can get going, you hear the little voice, clear this up, buddy, clear this up. Ain't going to listen till you clear this up. The Holy Spirit convicts us. So he will tell us what needs to be cleared up. That's a big comfort. Because you don't have to spend your life searching your soul and wondering if there's anything that needs to be taken care of. Don't worry. The Holy Spirit takes care of that. He will tell you what you need to confess. So that's the big one. Then the second thing we need to do is renounce it. Now, we may still stumble and do a similar thing again. But in our hearts, we say, Lord, I did sin against you. I repent of it. Please forgive me. And I don't want to do it again. Now, you know, it's an interesting thing. We need to deal with the problem of sin in our life radically within our spirits. Sometimes we, we look at uh, the effects of sin and, we, and the lack of inner peace with God, not understanding the indwelling Lord Jesus Christ. We need to deal with the flesh and the world and the devil radically in our hearts. You know, in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I, it's Christ living in me. So the flesh, it says in Galatians 5, 25, I think, it says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
In other words, we have to come to Christ and make a radical decision. I say, Lord, I want to walk in the light. I want to walk in transparency. I want to walk in victory. I want to overcome sin more and more and more that I may become more like Jesus Christ. So you deal radically. So the the point is, don't uh, coddle sin. Don't defend it. Don't argue on its behalf. Don't treat it lightly. Simply say, Lord, it was bad. It is wrong. I hate it. There's a psalm that says, you who love God hate sin. And you know, a believer hates sin in himself more than anything else. And I'm sure you do. But we have to deal with it. Now, sometimes we deal only with symptoms. And right now, for instance, in America, it's a big deal to talk about uh, an issue that is a real problem, and that is pornography. And uh, I got an article from the New York Times. There you go. I even look at it. And uh, it says, this is the title, Internet Porn Nearly Ruined His Life, and Now He Wants to Help Others. Internet Porn Nearly Ruined His Life, and Now He Wants to Help Others. So, it's true that porn can wreck your life, but it's not the real problem. It's a symptom of the problem. I've been thinking about that. Now there are courses and seminars all over the USA about pornography for men, because apparently it's really multiplying all over. Books are being written, seminars are being given, and so on. And it is a reasonable thing to do. But if all you deal with is internet porno, and why are you attracted? You've got to deal with the inner problem. The inner problem is, I am not satisfied with God. I am not satisfied with the Holy Spirit. As a believer, the unbelievers, poor guys, they fall for it all the time. They can't help it. But this fellow is not a believer. He says, I don't like religion. I don't push religion. But he set up a farm, and he bought an ex-church. Would you believe it? A, a building that his dad bought. He's only 26, so he has no moolah. But he bought this church, and he wants to have people who are uh, trapped by porno, internet porno, to come and try and help them get rid of it. They'll never get rid of it, really, until Jesus Christ in our heart fills us with his joy, fills us with his love. We are satisfied with him. We are filled with the Spirit. And although temptations may come in the area of sexuality and so on, but nevertheless, you don't use porn to satisfy a spiritual need. A spiritual need cannot be satisfied by the flesh in any form. And so we as believers have a privilege that non-believers know nothing about. And that is that the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. And so what the Lord was saying to Peter at this point, Peter, my boy, you picked up dust coming from your bath for the dinner. I got to wash your feet. And for us, we need to deal with it first by being washed. And that's a daily thing, a daily thing, because we may not have committed a very big one today, but our minds can get polluted. And before we go to bed at night, to be able to say, Lord, thank you for the blood of Jesus that purifies me from all sin. Thank you that though I had a few thoughts I should have had, some attitudes I should have displayed, some anger that I broke out on, some words I said I shouldn't have said, cleanse me, wash me, forgive me. And you know, this the famous First John. Huh? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the Lord will forgive you. In the Old Testament, where we learn by pictures and so on, lessons for the new, every morning and every night, while Israel was walking with God, they offered a lamb. And at the temple, the priests had to offer a lamb every morning. I mean, every single morning. And then every night before the, the lamps went out, they offered a lamb at the altar. And that's a picture of us being washed and prepared for every day and every evening. Israel didn't follow through on that. You know, after a few years, I presume they got tired and said, gee whiz, one of these lambs every morning, chip, chop, get the blood, do it, chop it up, put it on the fire, and I do it again every day. This is getting boring. And I'm afraid that we Christians sometimes feel the same way. No, we are to confess our sins the moment we catch it. And just in case, before you go to bed at night, say, Lord, did I offend you? <laughs> and you, the Holy Spirit will tell you just like that. You better believe it, buddy. Remember what you said at 3.15 at the office? Yeah, whatever, you know. Uh, he'll, he'll remind you so you can confess it. And confession simply means telling the Lord what happened. 
You say, well, the Lord knows it. He knows it, of course, he's God, but he wants you to confess it. And so you confess it. I say, Lord, I did this and this. I said this and that. I imagined this and that, or my attitude, whatever it is, confess it. And the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, will cleanse you. You can pass out and go to sleep at peace with the Lord. But it's a daily thing. And I think the lesson here that the Lord is giving us is this. Look, he's going to the cross in a few hours. Judas was going to deliver him for 30 miserable pieces of silver. Judas never did repent. Satan came into him. He obeyed satanic push. He went and committed suicide afterwards. He, he was lost. The fact is that the Lord is thinking, these are my men, and I want them to be close to me. To be close to me, they have to have clean feet. They have to have a pure conscience. They have to walk in, in the light with me. They have to walk in transparency, and then I can use them and bless them. So tonight we're through. But uh, I just want to remind you of this, that if you are going to live a life of joy, there has to be a dealing with that subject of sin. It doesn't have to be one of the super big ones, though it could be. It can be a lot of other things. A buddy of mine in the United States, he's been a successful guy. He and I used to meet whenever possible, and uh, he belonged to a church when he was 28, he and his wife became Christians in an unusual church service, but nothing unusual, just a regular guy. The details don't count right now. He went to church every Sunday, pretty much. His business was very successful, investment banker, hedge fund of funds, I mean, big box. It was doing well. He would give money to causes. He would speak at rich club, people, Christian conference people, you know. He was uh, a, a great giver to... Uh, fighting sexual trafficking, which is a big deal right now, too. And uh, he, he was very open about it, and they gave a lot of money and so on. A, a regular guy. He was not a show-off. He was not a put-on. I would meet with him, and we would talk and do little meditations over breakfast and pray a little bit and look at the Bible. And from time to time, he would say to me, you know, pray for my brother Anthony. Call him Anthony. Uh, you know, he drinks a bit too much. He watches porno, and then he goes out with the ladies, and, you know, I feel bad for him. And then he asked me to pray for his dad, and then he led his dad to Jesus Christ. And uh, we became friends of the family, we know them well, love them. He's a great guy. One day at about 10.20 at night, I get a phone call. I know that he was joking, because we joked and so on. 10.20, you know, I was in bed. I don't go to bed that early, but I was in bed. Got up, called up, and, hey, I said, don't you realize it's 10.20? He said, don't joke, man, don't joke. Tonight on the 11 o'clock news, you're going to see my face. Tomorrow is going to be in the newspaper. What happened? Well, he said, I haven't told you the truth all these years. I was caught by the police in one of those traps that they do, you know, on the internet. They, you know, promote this lady wants to go out with you. I'm not in that circle, but anyway, they were waiting for him at the motel, caught him, appeared in the paper, and, uh, he had to tell his wife, his daughters, one son. It's like the whole world was collapsing around. And uh, the daughters cussed him to death. His oldest daughter said, you being a hypocrite, you're talking about helping kids out of sexual slavery and giving money, and you were doing it yourself. You weren't there with us. It was quite a battle. The wife, very godly, very godly. She prayed. She wanted to kick him out, his money and everything. But the Lord spoke to her and said, I want you to be me to him. Uh, she didn't like it at first. She said, Lord, are you crazy? she's been going out with these women for years. And he told me later, Luis, I never told you the truth. And he says, I'm not sure that I was really a Christian. I had no fear of God. I figured God is going to overlook it. After all, you know, I give money. I help the poor. I'm helping the girls who are being used. Uh, and he was in with it too, you know. And then one day when we began to, he began to recuperate. He cried. He pleaded for forgiveness. His wife forgave him. The kids, now the kids say, Dad, at last we can feel close to you again. There was always a barrier between us and you. And it was that he became totally open about it. But, you know, he said to me one day, Luis, I am really sorry that I lied to you for such a long time. You know, I never guessed. I'm a pretty smart guy. 
I've been around. I, I think I have the gift of discernment, but I never discerned that he was putting me on. And then he said, you know, now he talks to men's groups. And he said, no more cheating, no more lying, no more secrets. He said, you know, it all starts with cheating. And then you determine you got to lie to cover it up. And then you begin to hide things from your wife and people who know you. And you know, he's come out into the open. The Lord forgave him. He's walked a victorious life. His business has come down. He's still not short, but you know, people aren't investing like they used to. Uh, they know him in Wall Street. Everybody over there knows what happened. Ha, ha, ha. You know, like they're all saints over there. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, he's bounced back. Forgiven, reconciled with his wife. His kids now love him like never before. They say the barrier is gone. There was a barrier that they couldn't explain. I didn't even notice it. And I'm pretty sharp. But that shows you that a smart person can cover something up for ages and ages and never come out. But the, don't wait for a crisis to hit you like my buddy. Don't wait for your name to appear in the papers. Come to the Lord while he gives you time. And come and say, Lord, wash my feet, wash my conscience, clean me, Lord, accept me. I want to walk. And now he's walking in the light and he's wide open, talks about it. And I like the three points that many guys who have come through. I notice how the same idea, no more cheating, no more lying, no more secrets. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that that night, 2,000 years ago, you knew that you were going to the cross. You knew that all our sin would be laid on you. And yet you were thinking of us and us being close to you and walking in victory and transparency and uh, filled with you. Lord Jesus, we worship you tonight. We thank you for the blood of the cross that keeps on cleansing us from all sin. We thank you, Lord, that we can walk in the light and not in darkness, that we can walk in truth and not in lies, that we can walk in, uh, in victory for your glory. Tonight, Lord, it's been a bit of a solemn message, a bit of a serious moment, but we know, Lord, that that's what sets us free. And we thank you for the truth that sets us free, that if we confess our sins, you are just and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Lord, speak to our hearts tonight. Help us to walk in the light every day. Help us to walk in victory. Help us to walk in transparency. Help us, oh, Lord, to be fruitful for your glory, to bring pleasure to the Holy Spirit and not grieve him. And tonight, oh, Lord, we bow before you, thanking you for the cleansing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen. This is Kevin Palau, one of Luis Palau's sons. Toward the end of Dad's life, he had zero regrets about spending his years sharing the good news. He was convinced that an even greater harvest was waiting in the generations to come. We agree, and we're continuing the work Dad started. We are passionate about bringing the gospel to every person on the planet. Millions still don't know the hope that's found only in Jesus Christ. If Dad was here today, I think he would say, don't wait. Share Jesus today wherever you go. If you'd like to join with us in spreading the good news around the world, you can visit luispalau.org to give a God-honoring gift today. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you.